Okay, so let's talk about the motivation of the global basis. I mean, what why we need to use uh, the global basis. So consider a simple algebra generated by three uh, variables x, y, z, and uh, if we want to uh, make a presentation, we need an ideal here of our relations. And many people may choose different presentations of the ideals. For example, it, it could be generated by x plus y and y squared plus z squared. And it could be x plus y and x squared plus, plus z squared. And these two ideals are the same. They, they are the same ideals of this polynomial algebra. But uh, you can imagine that in a more complicated case that where there are much more, much more variables and much more relations, it, it, it will, it's going to be very hard to figure out whether two choices of generators of an ideal uh, generate the, the same ideal. For example, uh, the E2 page of the atom spectral sequence uh, in the range up to 200 in 20 uh, total degree. It has a presentation of 1,566 generators and uh, approx approximately 100,000 relations. And that is huge. And uh, so we need a, a good way to organize those uh, generators and relations. And here I provide a link uh, to a web page I, I made uh, for, for the Adams Edu page. Uh, I, uh, you can find it here, and uh, you can see uh, you can see that it, it's a huge algebra. And uh, so, the theory of global basis come to rescue when we want to maintain a huge algebra, and we can do many interesting calculations by just by a computer. And to define a global basis, we should fix the total ordering of monomials uh, in a polynomial algebra. You can expect that because on a computer, you always have to uh, make, a, make a choice of all the ordering. For example, if you have a vector space, then you always order, uh, choose a basis and order them, and then you can do uh, some programming on it. So we fix the total ordering and that, that should not be just a random total ordering. It should be such an ordering that uh, if you have three monomials, M and L, uh, where M and N are in the same degree. So because, uh, and so, so if the multiplication of L should preserve the order, uh, if M is less than N, then ML should be less than NL. And uh, so if you uh, Google it, Google the global basis, you may find a slightly different definition because as an algebraic policy, uh, the most, most of the algebra I care are graded algebras. So this is a kind of, kind of a graded version of, uh, for the global basis that usually only, you only compare uh, monomials in the same degree because in algebraic topology most um, polynomials are homogeneous so usually so 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 this is usually how we how we order the monomials first you order the monomials by degree and then you order the monomials by something else for example uh, order them lexicographically or or in reverse order uh, of the lex lexicographical ordering. So yeah, you, so these are two common examples and there, there are many other examples. So let's assume that we already have a, have a ordering. Now make a, let's make a notation that uh, LM is going to denote the leading monomial. So lead LM for leading monomial of F is the, is the largest monomial in F uh, with respect to this ordering. So it means that in the algorithms of global basis, we always prefer to write a polynomial in, de 
increasing order. Yeah. Okay. So let's define, now let's define a group on a basis. If G is a generating set of an ideal I, we call that a group on a basis. If it satisfies this property that all monomials not divisible by any one of the leading monomial of G in G projects, projects to a K basis of, of the quotient ring. So if you have a quotient ring, P over an ideal I, somehow we want, want to get a, a, a basis over K. I mean, the quotient ring is a vector space over K. We want to obtain a, a, an additive basis. This additive basis is described by G in the sense that all the monomials not divisible by any one of the leading monomial in G form a K basis of R. So if, if G satisfy this description, then, then it's, uh, it's called a global basis. Okay, so now the definition itself uh, gives us an application of the global basis. So it is often the case that R is an infinitely dimensional vector space over K. I mean, the quotient algebra might be simple. I mean, it could be the polynomial algebra with no relations, and then it's definitely an infinite dimensional uh, vector space over K. However, uh, by Hilbert basis theorem, uh, we can always find a finite global basis G for I. And thus, by the above definition, we can have a, a, a nice description of a K basis of R. So, I mean, this set of bases is infinite, but it's described by all monomials not divisible by any one of the finite many monomials. So it's, it's kind of a finite description, which is nice, so that we can explicitly understand the, the infinite, uh, the, the, the basis of R, uh, of infinite size. Okay, so let me give you an application of this, uh, of this application that uh, I proved something like this in my thesis, that there is a big sub-algebra uh, uh, of the E2 page of the main spectral sequence. So this is the X group for the main associated graded algebra of the spinor algebra. And I proved that uh, there's a sub-algebra which is neopotent free. Usually things like this is hard to prove because it's a complicated algebra with many generators and relations. And I can prove that it's neopotent free and how uh, by use of the global basis. Uh, so by global basis, I, I, I found a F2 basis B of this subalgebra such that this basis is closed under the Frobenius map. So which means that if you have a monomial inside the basis, then the square of that is also in the basis. So if you have a linear combination of an element which is, which is zero in, in this algebra, then if you square that, because the squaring is the Frobenius map, which is a, the, a, a ring homomorphism, then you, you get the sum of the squares. Then all those squares are in the basis again, and therefore the square cannot be zero. So if an element, element is not zero, then you square it, it's still not, not zero in this uh, sub-algebra B. And uh, so by the help of global basis, I'm able to prove uh, such a theorem. Okay. And uh, now I only talk, so far I only talked about the definition of global basis. You, I, you, you must kind of prove that it exists, right? Otherwise it's not useful. Uh, and the, the fact that it's all, it always exists and there is a very effective algorithm to compute uh, a global basis. So if I have an ideal generated by K elements, uh, there's an algorithm called Batsberger's algorithm. Uh, it will help us to obtain the global basis G of I. So usually the global basis is B 
bigger than the minimal generating set of an open ideal. So you have to add some kind of redundant element in order to be a groveland basis. So we start from the from a generating set of i, and then we keep doing this. So for each pair in G, we define the leading monomial mi and mj, and then we define mij mji. So that the upshot of is that of that is is we want to cancel out the leading terms of G i and G j. So we multiply G i and G and G j by some monomials such that the two polynomial have exactly the same leading, poly, uh, leading monomial. So that's our purpose. We make the leading monomials the same. I mean, we scale them up to the least common divisor, a uh, least common multiple, then we, add them together, uh, sorry, actually I should write minus here. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are working over prime two uh, because over, over prime two plus one negative one are, are the same. So actually uh, for, for general characteristic, I, I should put minus here. I want to cancel out the, the common leading monomial. So yeah, sorry, it, it should be minus here. So we have to cancel out that we reduce it by G, by, redu by reduction, I mean, uh, if, if this polynomial contains some monomial divisible by some leading monomial, then you should kind of rewrite that. You can further cancel that out and, and rewrite that. It's called, you keep doing that, it's called a reduction. Okay, so we reduce that and then by Z, and then we get a, a, a new polynomial. And then if it, it is not zero, you add it to Z. So we repeat the above two steps until there are no more pair G, I, G, J, and no more new S, I, J that we can add to B, uh, we can add to Z. And you may ask, uh, is it guaranteed that uh, this algorithm can terminate uh, in a finite time? And the answer is yes, by the, by the Hilbert basis theorem, which basically says that uh, any, any uh, ideal of the, of the finite, finitely generated, any ideal I of, of, of this polynomial algebra is always finitely generated. So you can expect that all, all leading monomials, uh, the ideal generated by the leading monomials uh, is also finitely generated. So we only need finite many G here to get the correct uh, thing. So, so, the, so the algorithm will not uh, proceed infinitely. You, it will always stop at a certain point. Okay, so this algorithm is basically a combination of the Gauss elim elimination in linear algebra and uh, the Euclidean algorithm. Okay, so if you are confused by this uh, page here, it, it doesn't matter that much. The, the, the point is that we can compute a global basis and uh, it is somewhat efficient. You can do it uh, of effectively oftentimes and, uh, and, and the algorithm itself also guarantees that the global basis exists. It's, it's always a thing. So let me give an example that I have a polynomial algebra generated by five elements and I order monomials by, uh, by degree and then by lexical graphical ordering. And then the ideal here is generated by xy plus a and xz plus b. And then the outcome of the global basis is this. It is one element more than the original generating set. You have to add this one more element. And the, the way you get this is simple, that uh, you multiply this by G and multiply this by Y, and then both leading monomials becomes, become X, Y, Z, and then you subtract them, uh, you, you get this. Uh, there's no minus sign here because I'm, because I'm working a prime over prime uh, two here, so plus minus doesn't matter. Uh, and, and so, yeah, so you have an additional uh, element here. Here, 
GA is not divisible by XY, it is not divisible by XC, is something new. Uh, you have uh, something new leading monomial. And you need this for G to be Grobner basis. I here is not a Grobner basis because uh, you can obtain a basis for the quotient algebra P over I, uh, such that the basis can be presented by all, represented by all monomials, not divisible by any one of the X, Y, X, Z, and Z, A. If you exclude all multiples of these monomials, then you obtain a basis of the, of the quotient algebra. So that's why the Grobner basis is useful. It describes a basis of R. And therefore this redundant one is necessary. Although it's not necessary uh, for generating R, but it's necessary for generating the basis of R. Okay. Next, I'm going to talk about the uniqueness of the Grobner basis. So, so, so it's a little bit kind of uh, similar to the linear algebra. We also kind of have a more reduced version of the Gauss elimination. You, you, it's, I think it's called reduced row echelon form. So here we have a, also a reduced version that you have to guarantee that all leading monomials of the Grobner basis that does not divide, divide each other. If you have a something, something divisible, then you just abandon abandon that. Then you get the same Grobner basis for the same, uh, you get a, the Grobner basis of the same ideal. So, and, and then there's another condition that the, the monomials, the monomials show up, I mean, the monomials other than the leading one should not be divisible by any leading term. I mean, it should be in the basis. That's what I mean. Every, every, every uh, uh, polynomial in the group in a reduced global basis G should be something like certain leading monomials plus uh, some other basis uh, of the uh, of the algebra. Okay, so it, it's it, it's simple to obtain a reduced one. Uh, from, a, from an unreduced one. I mean, so just by abandoning the one that's divisible by others and also rewrite other monomials uh, if, if it's divisible by something not in the basis, you just rewrite that by, by, the, by the ideal. Okay, so there's a unique, unique list theorem that when the monomial ordering is fixed, then the reduced Grobner basis for an ideal I is unique. So you get a unique, a kind of a unique presentation of an ideal. And oftentimes, so when I talk about ideal, actually I care about the quotient ring of P over I. So, by the, so this is an application. By the uniqueness theorem, if we fix a monomial ordering, then we can write every ideal of P in a unique form. And this is very useful. That we can make sure that it's all, always very convenient if we have a unique form uh, for things we care about. And it's especially important in computer, uh, in computer programming because if, ev if everything has a unique form, then you can easily compare uh, different things. I mean, in order to determine uh, they are the same or not. Okay. Uh, and you may ask questions about questions about monomial orderings because the algorithm of the Grobner basis depends on a choice of monomial orderings, and that's actually an advantage of for us because we can play with the monomial orderings. Uh, actually, the, the use of different monomial orderings results in something uh, useful. For example, let's consider the lexicographical ordering. And we consider the Grobner basis G for this algebra uh, generated by some X and some Y. So here I actually, uh, I, what, I actually care about the quotient algebra P over I. And uh, so, I mean, I mean, I is kind of the presentation for the relations of that ideal. So here, uh, if we consider the subset G prime of G uh, by uh, consists of elements which only involve variables y. Then this g prime 
give us a presentation for the sub-algebra of the quotient ring generated by y1, y2, yn. So what I mean is that if we order, if we if we order the monomials lexicographically and we put those y after x, I mean, we put those y kind of, we treat them as the last uh, generators. Then by taking a subset of the globular basis for i, we kind of get the globular basis for, for j such that I mean, k over this j is a presentation for the sub-algebra generated by y1 to ym. So this is very useful. That I'm telling you that if I have a presentation of an algebra, then the, the, the algorithm of the global basis can give you a, a presentation of a sub-algebra generated by element of your choice. So for example, let's consider the sub-algebra of kx generated by x square and x, cube, x cube. We, we all know that it's isomorphic to this, uh, this algebra, uh, kyz over y square minus z square, uh, y cube minus the z square. Uh, because we can apply this algorithm that uh, we, we, we make a algebra generated by three variables. Here, y and z are actually dummy variables. Uh, y is equal to x squared and z is equal to x cubed. So basically, this algebra over i is isomorphic to kx. We just add two dummy variables, y and z, so that it's exactly the last kind of the last two, uh, the last few variables. And uh, and, and you, if you compute the global basis of this, and we are order the monomials lexicographically, um, remember that, and then we can append this global basis. And you see that the only uh, element here that only involves y and z uh, are, is this one, uh, y cubed uh, minus j squared. Uh, all those involve uh, x, so we ad abandon them and, and only and there's only one left. And that's exactly the presentation for the sub-algebra, the sub-algebra generated by x squared and x cubed. So this is a very simple example, but imagine that if you have a complicated, much more complicated algebra here, it's not just kx, it's, a, it's, it's generated by many generators and many relations. And you, and you just give me a few elements. And then by global basis, I mean by the computer, uh, using global basis, then you can easily obtain the presentation for the for the sub algebra, and this is useful. Okay. Uh, next, uh, let's consider another different monomial uh, ordering. It's the reversed one. It's the reversed lexicographical ordering, and uh, and so we have a, a different theorem that if you consider the global basis with respect to this reversed lexicographical ordering, and then you consider a subset C double prime whose leading terms involve variable X, I. So it's kind of the opposite. Previously, we care about Y, now we care about X. And previously, we, we only want elements only involve Y, I, not X, I. Here, we, we want terms involve X, it doesn't matter if in, it involves y, uh, as long as it involves x, x, then we want them. Uh, and that's the subset, z double prime. So then we can extract from z double prime all relations among x1 uh, through xn inside the algebra p over i. So what does this mean? That we can compute a presentation of an ideal j generated by some elements in R uh, equal to R over I. So, I mean, you can compute things like annihilator of an element, for example, if in this R, if there's an element in this R and you want to understand the ideal, for example, uh, the ideal that annihilates annihilate, uh, certain elements in R. So, for example, if you have an element X, you want to know, understand all Y 
such that x times y is zero. All those y form, uh, uh, form an ideal. And uh, by, by this theorem, you can obtain a presentation for such an ideal. For example, you can obtain kind of minimal generating set for that kind of thing. So it's useful. So, so, so the two theorems are both uh, useful, one for computing the presentation of the sub-algebra, one for the <coughs> kind of the, 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 for the ideals. Okay, so we have more algorithms about other things. For example, we can compute intersections, unions, and products of, of two ideals of P. By, 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 by com computation, I mean concrete, concrete computation. You, you interpret everything, you write everything explicitly as a presentation of like a generators and relations. And, and by the use of granular basis, you can handle all the, all, all the job to the, you can hand all the job to the computer. Uh, okay, so, and, and there are also many other algorithms. Uh, okay, next. I'm going to talk about uh, I'm going to talk about uh, modules. So, so uh, originally when I talk about Groblin basis, it feels like I'm I'm concerning kind of algebras, uh, algebras uh, presented by a polynomial algebra over an ideal. But actually, we can do Groblin basis over uh, on modules over R. And here is a very useful observation that, M, that modules M uh, over R are in one-to-one -one correspondence to graded algebras, something like this, R plus M plus zero plus zero uh, over R concentrated in degree zero and one. So this is a graded algebra and the degree zero should be R and the degree one is something and then degree two and beyond are all trivial. Then all these kind of Algebras, graded, graded algebras over R are in one to, to one correspondence, co correspondence to, to M. Uh, you, you just, if you have a, such a graded algebra, then you just extract the degree one part, and that's exactly the module. So it, it, it's a one to one correspondence. And hence, a module over R can be presented by something, uh, something like this. So I have an uh, algebra which is P, uh, P is the polynomial algebra over some ideal. And now I want to present a module over R and it looks something like this. So it, uh, you adjoin the polynomial algebra with some elements of the monomials. And then the relations would be I of course, because that's something describing R and then you have M I M J. Why? Because the graded algebra is concentrated in degree zero and one, and there's nothing beyond. So every product of two elements in M should be trivial here. So therefore, in order to describe this algebra, uh, you must guarantee that M I M times M J for all I and J should be trivial. Uh, I mean, they should be in the relations. And then you have a bunch of other relations. That's kind of the module structure of R over M. So it's something, something like some R times some M plus some another R times another M equals zero. It's, it's, it's the rest of the relations. So, so here you see that we can use the, we can study the, this kind of, uh, the, the Groblin basis for this kind of ideals uh, in, inside the kind of extended uh, polynomial algebra uh, to describe modules over M. So what I'm saying is that you can use Groblin basis to study modules over R, not, not, not just rings, but also rings over modules. And this is very useful. So we can apply the Groblin basis to do many things in the module theory, such as calculating presentations of the kernel and co-kernel of a morphism between two modules over R. And, uh, 
and and that's just two examples. We can do many many other interesting things, and and hence we can do homological algebra, uh, including computing like tor and x. We can give uh, as long as they are kind of commutative algebras, we can find a way to to get a presentation for the tor and x groups. Usually these are complicated tasks that if uh, when A is big and when the module M and N are big, it's usually very hard to compute by hand uh, the, the X uh, groups or ring. Okay. And uh, let me give you an example uh, of, 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 of using global basis uh, to, to, to do homological uh, algebra. So here is a theorem. Uh, if A is a finitely generated commutative differential graded algebra over FP, uh, there are many restrictions here. I, first, I have to I want to make sure that it's finitely generated uh, as an algebra, and then it should be commutative, and it's a differential graded algebra over a field, a field of finite characteristic. Actually, uh, it it could be this P could be a square of or could be a power of primes also. It just have to be a field of finite characteristics. And then the homology of A, remember that A is a differential, it's a DGA. Therefore, you can define the homology of A, which, which is an algebra. So then it's A is also a finitely generated algebra over FP. And uh, this, this theorem is false if the field is, is of characteristic zero. For example, if this is Q or, or, or the complex numbers or, or the real numbers, then this theorem is false. But uh, for, for finite fields, for example, it is true. And this will bring the question, since A, if A is a finitely generated algebra, then you can kind of have a finite presentation. I mean, finite many generators and finite many relations, then you can input those into the computer. And now you have the homology and the theorem says that it's also finite generated. And then therefore it also ha has a finite presentation. You should be able to describe the, uh, the homology by, uh, by finite many relations and generators. And then, you may wonder, is there such an algorithm to give you a presentation of the homology for you from a presentation for A? I mean, since H A is finite, then we want an algorithm to compute that. Okay, now let me, first, let me give you a proof of this theorem. Uh, it, it, it's a little bit strange that I cannot find this theorem in any publication, but I believe some people know knows it. Okay. Uh, the proof is actually not very hard. Uh, so let Z to be uh, let Z be the set of all cycles, uh, and let A to P be all the elements, all the P powers inside inside A. I mean. Actually, they are, they are cycles because we are working over prime P. Therefore, all powers of P are cycles uh, in, in, in this DGA. Okay, so consider the P powers inside the cycles. Now we have the following. Uh, so first, we know that A is a finitely generated AP module. So keep in mind that uh, A to P here is actually a sub-algebra of A. It's a sub-algebra of A, so itself is an algebra. So we can view A as a module, as a module over AP. And we can claim that it's finitely generated because it's actually generated by all monomials that the exponents uh, do not exceed P. So it, I think it's simple to see that. Uh, and, and there are only finite many generators and therefore all monomials where the, the, the exponent are not too big, there are only finite many of them. So therefore A is a finite 
finitely generated AP module. Okay, next, G is an AP sub-module of A. So first, G is a, uh, is a module over AP because it's all cycles and you can prove, and it's easy to, easy to, see, to, to see that uh, a P power times a cycle is again a cycle. Therefore, G is an AP module and therefore it's an AP sub-module of A because A is also an AP module. And now you have uh, something useful. G should be a finite, finitely generated AP module. Why? Because in the in the theory of of uh, of modules, rings and modules, uh, remember that uh, a finitely generated module over a Noetherian ring is also Noetherian. Therefore, all its all its sub modules should be also Noetherian. And if A is a Noetherian ring. It basically means that G should be finally generated. So we, we are taking advantage of, of the fact that A is finally generated. And, uh, and therefore, we can use the theory of, of Noetherian uh, rings and modules. And, uh, and I mean, this is kind of useful, but it, it's also complicated because, if, because the, the dimension for for, for, for a sub-module of a finite module can be bigger than the, than the bigger module. I mean, the, the, sub -mod, the dimension of a sub-module can be bigger than, uh, than another module. Right? So, but we have the theorem that it's, it's, it's finite. It's finitely generated. It's, uh, it's guaranteed. OK, so now we know the cycles is a finitely generated uh, powers module. Then, then of course, the cycles itself is a finite, finitely generated algebra. I mean, it's a finitely generated module over a, a finitely generated algebra. And therefore, as an algebra itself, it's finitely generated. OK, and now we are done. Since the homology becomes a finitely generated algebra over an ideal of, 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 of it, then it's a finitely generated algebra. You, you are just adding more relations into, into this algebra. And uh, therefore, it's finitely generated algebra. OK, now this is the complete proof. And uh, OK, so now we want to do this concretely. So A is finitely generated. Therefore, uh, if we want to input this into a computer, then it has a finite presentation is described by generators and relations. And since it's a DGA, we also have to specify specify the, 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 the uh, differentials. And because it's a DGA, we only have to specify the, the, the differentials for the generators. And then we know the, 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 whole, gener uh, the, the whole differential structure on A by Leibniz rule. Okay, so this is the input for the algorithm. Now we want the output, which is with the presentation for the homology. The homology, we want to, we would like to present the homology as also generators and relations. And we also want to specify the, 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 the representation for the, for, the psych, uh, for the homology class. We want to, for each homology class, we want to uh, know which cycles in A uh, that represents uh, the, the, the homology class. So that's what we want, want to get uh, from the computer. So the question is how? And uh, now let's go back to a proof. Actually a proof itself give us the answer uh, together with the, all the algorithms have been introduced so far. So for example, you want to uh, present A. So first we have a presentation of A. Then consider the P powers, all the P powers. It's a sub-algebra of A. And remember that by Grobner basis, we can compute, uh, by the Grobner basis, we can compute uh, the, sub, the presentation of a sub-algebra. So let's use that. And therefore we can obtain a concrete uh, presentation for the A to P. 
I mean by by generators and relations. Okay, so so we now we have a concrete algorithm for for understanding A to P. Next, we should write A in terms of A P module. So A originally is a, a algebra, but now we kind of degenerate it. Uh, to 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 uh, just an AP module. So remember that we can always pre uh, write a module in terms of grammar basis. You should also do that. Uh, so it, it's doable. Uh, basically, you, you you just consider. Uh, you have to make a choice of of the generator for for the for the module for the AP module. You can pick up all kind of the the. The, the small monomials and where the, the, the exponents are all small, that, that can be the generator for the A. And then you can figure out the module structure uh, of A over AP. And now remember that by global basis, we can also compute the presentation of actually some algebra, but that can be transplanted to the, to the, to the, to the theory of modules. I mean, the, the Grobner basis also works for modules. So the, uh, the original algorithm for computing some algebras can be transplanted uh, to, to the algorithm for computing presentation for sub modules. There is a such an algorithm. So we can also obtain a sub module structure of a, a sub module structure for, for, for G itself. So, and that's it. And uh, after we have G, and then we have we have G over B. But there's a pitfall here that uh, what we obtain for G is a module representation uh, over AP. So we have an AP module uh, presentation of G, and by G over B, actually we have in the end we are, we will get the homology is a module over AP. So in the end, if we want to obtain the, the, the homology as an algebra, other than just a AP module, we have, we have to do something more. Uh, and those are kind of uh, extension problems. I mean, rem remember that the modules kind of, the presentation of modules is kind of like this. You have, you have to uh, make relations like every, every product of two, uh, elements in the module should be zero. And then you have to, now if you treat HA as a algebra other than a module, then you have to solve extensions. Uh, MI times MJ should equal to something uh, in lower filtrations like M itself. So MI times MJ should actually equal something, something in M. And those are kind of extension problems. And, but the upshot, that is that at least we have a presentation of, uh, of the homology as a module. Therefore, therefore you, you, you have an upper, I mean, therefore you have a, you can obtain a basis for the homology and, and, and you also have an upper limit, upper bound for the relations. You just have to solve the, uh, the, the extensions one by one and then you are done. Then you know that you get the complete presentation for the homology and there's no further information to be added. You just have to solve the extension problems one by one and, and that's it. Okay, so that's a algorithm for computing the homology of a finitely generated DGA. And this is very useful. Uh, let me give you an example. So here I'm, in my thesis, I'm, I, I was studying the main spectral sequence. So if you consider the E2 page of the main spectral sequence by the thesis of main, uh, the E2 page of the main spectral sequence can be computed by the homology of a DGA X. And what kind of X, X is this? X is an algebra. X is actually kind of simple. X is a polynomial algebra. Uh, it has infinite many generators with double indices, uh, but it, it, it's the differential which is kind of complicated. It does not look complicated, but the, co the co complexity comes from the fact that you have any infinite many of them, and uh, that that makes things kind of complicated. 
that that the homology of X does not have a, a very explicit, I mean, it is not known yet uh, for the complete description. Actually, in my thesis, I have a conjecture to describe the entire uh, entire E2 page completely, but it's a, it's a conjecture that I, I, I was not able to prove yet. And uh, so, but I, I've done something in low stems. So we consider a sub DGA. This sub DGA is generated by RIJ up to index seven. So actually it's a very big sub algebra and the homology of this sub algebra is isomorphic to the whole E2 page in a large range of, of, of lower stems. So, so they are the same in, 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 I think in stems up to 285. So, so in some sense, it, it's, it's very close to the E2 page it, uh, in, and it's a sub algebra. And in my thesis, I've, you can find a full presentation of this sub algebra. And I'm, I'm able to, to compute this uh, because I, I apply the, all these algorithms of Grobner basis. Okay, so here I'm going to introduce some uh, further projects on Grobner basis. And first, I want a generalization of the Grobner basis. There are some, okay. So uh, I want to apply, uh, obtain a generalization of Grobner basis to a certain type of non-commutative algebra. And this is important because in algebraic topology, we have a lot of algebras that are not commutative and it's very tricky to deal with them. We know that the Gromner basis works very well in a, in a computational, I think people call them computa com computational uh, commutative algebra or some people call, call it uh, the computational algebraic geometry. And uh, they, they only deal with commutative algebras, but in algebraic policy, there are many important algebras which are not commutative. For example, the Steenrod algebra. And then I want to apply the global basis to that. And therefore I need a certain generalization. And actually I haven't, I, I have done it, uh, uh, but I have not published it yet. And uh, and in the beginning of this talk, I, I give you a link for the E2 page for the Steenrod algebra, which is the X root for this algebra. It's actually computed by my generalization of the global basis. The, 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 the algorithm is it's so efficient that I'm able to compute the, the I'm able to compute the X group uh, up to, I think up to 200, I'm able to, I, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, I think I have a problem with my track pack. Track pad. I can compute up to two hundred here uh, on the personal computer uh, in one half of the day, and uh, you don't need a po very power powerful machine. Now the algorithm runs very fast, and you can compute up to two hundred just in half of the day. I mean, in approximately 10 hours or, or, or less. Okay, sorry. Uh, and uh, so that's a, that's a good thing that we have, we can generalize the global basis to non-commutative algebras. And then I also want to generalize the theory of global basis to a certain type of commutative algebras with infinite, infinitely many generators. So, I mean, a human can deal with uh, gener uh, algebras with infinitely many generators, right? Uh, of certain form, for example, uh, if you compute the, if you compute the E2 page of the, of the uh, Adams, the E2 page of the Adams spectral sequence, and some people compute, compute it uh, line by line, horizontally. If you consider uh, the algebra below this line, below the line of S equals two, 
you get, get an algebra uh, generated by HI over the relations HI times HI plus one for I equal zero until infinity. So it has infinite many generators and, and, uh, and infinite many relations, but as a human, we, we kind of can understand it, but currently the, the, the current framework for the global basis does not work for that because the current current theory of corona basis require that the algebra to be finite finitely generated. So actually, I want I want the generalization to infinite generator, and, and of course it cannot be all algebra with infinite many generators. I I, I need certain compact restriction. Uh, for example, uh, I can I can uh, I I can uh, insist that the there's a there's a action on the algebra uh, which which can kind of uh, translate a generator to another generator and then I can insist that uh, there are only many families or, or, or only only finite many orbits uh, under the that action although there are fin infinite many generators but but there are only finite many finitely many orbits, then I, with, that, uh, with that constraint, then I can make the theory of Grombland basis work again. And that would be useful uh, in certain form. And actually I have, I have part of the theory uh, implemented uh, now, but, uh, but I think it need to be refined. I, I want to, I want to generate gener generate this as far as possible. Okay, and then this is something I, I haven't thought of yet, but I, I want something like this. I want a, a non-commutative algebra with infinite many generators. It's going to be hard, and I'm not sure if if if, if it's feasible. And uh, but I want to apply this. I want to combine both to maybe a certain uh, certain limit uh, to very limited limited type of of non commutative algebra with infinite many generators I, I don't know I, I don't know how far we can go uh, in this direction and then we can also try to generalize the theory of global basis to commutative algebra over some rings so i forgot to tell you uh, in the beginning that the global basis at least the, the current theory of global basis only work over fields. They only work over fields, not arbitrary uh, rings. So I want certain generalization. I want to work over, for example, over integers. I, I want to study algebras over integers and, or, or, or the local rings of integers, etc. Et so it would be nice to have a algorithm uh, so that you can you can do more job on the computer. Okay, so I think this is the end of my talk. Uh, do you have any questions? Now is the question time. Okay, uh, I think if there's no question, then that's the end. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. So the next talk will be on 3.30 after maybe 35 minutes.